can separate us? Come on, y'all. Who can separate us from the love of Jesus?
dress. They're just a bunch of talk. So oftentimes you find yourself in a position to say, but he told me that he loved me. What, what happened? He never loved you. That's the bottom line. These, these boys and men will tell you anything to get in bed with you. And then when you get out of the bed, their promise gets out with them and going out the door. So but when God tells you something, you can depend on it. He will not fail you. He will not let you down. He will always be there. When everybody else is gone, he's there. When nothing else works, he is there. When something looks like it's going to fall apart, he is there. I praise him for that. You need something sure in your life. Quit putting your confidence in things that are temporary. They might be here. They may not be. People may say, you know, I love you, and really they don't. But when he tells you I love you, he proved it. He proved it because he sent his son to die. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what? The great thing that Jesus said, gave a promise. And he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come again. Receive you to myself. You know what? We would be in a bad situation if God told us, I'm going to prepare a place for you and never show back up. You couldn't deal with that. You couldn't deal with every promise that tells us if we serve God, He's going to bless your life. He's not going to uh, just fall out mill way. He's not just going to get to a certain point and say, You know, I thought I could. I built some mansions in heaven, but I ran out of material. And I'm sorry, I had planned to give you one, but I can't give it to you. That's never going to happen. I can't imagine standing before God and giving your life to him, and he said, uh, Rose, I'm sorry, ain't no more room up here. Can you imagine that? But when you can believe what he says, and know that the word of God is sure, and it's never, ever going to fall, fall apart. It is what it is. And I thank you for that this morning. See, nothing gives us that kind of assurance but God. Nothing else can. Because every person in this building this morning, no matter how you love these people, your family, your friends, it's going to come a time you're going to have to check out in spite of whatever's going on. you got to leave. I remember... Uh, having a dream about my husband, uh, well, maybe some months before he passed away. And I dreamed that the Lord came and got him. And I woke up in the dream, I was crying, and when I woke up, I was still crying. <laughs> and he said, honey, what's wrong? I said, I had this horrible dream. He said, what is it? That God came and took you away. And he said, I'm not going to leave my boo. He used to call me boo. I'm not going to leave my boo. And I said, I thought to myself, but you, you don't have the control over him. If it was up to you, no, you would never have left me. But it ain't in your power. And I came to church and I told the girls in the office, I said, I dreamed that God came and got daddy. And so everybody was kind of emotional and crying and what have you. I looked through the door and I saw daddy coming. I said, I don't want to leave because he'll get upset. So everybody just kind of played it off. But he really did. All after 34 years of marriage, a good marriage, it's, it's like all of a sudden it's gone. That was the thing that hit me the hardest was that suddenly my life totally changed. I sat almost at all wondering what happened. It's like a tornado or something just ripped through your life. One minute you're laughing on vacation, you're having fun with each other and doing all this, and the next day, it's over. It's hard to fathom that. And I say to every person this morning, at some point in your life, the thing that you love the most, the thing that you shared your life with, one day it will be over, regardless of the promise. But if we hold on to one thing, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He never will leave us. He's always there. In the time of trouble and darkness and all the things that happen, he is always there. All oh, that makes you feel a sense of security that whatever happens, God's going to take care of.
of me. He will take care of you if you surrender your life to him. But if you don't give him your life, you don't have nothing. We need something sure that works, that's in place, that I know without a doubt. If I wake up in the morning, it's still going to be there. Next week, next month, it's still going to be there. The promises never, never go away because he promised us. So he said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. See, surely I'm going to bless you. Surely I'm going to multiply. He did exactly what he said. And then you go to the scripture, out of all the promises that God made to his people, you go to the scripture, and then it says, and he told David, if that had not been enough, I would have gave you even more. So God is in the business of giving us more. He wants to bless our life. And you think, well, what more could he give? What more could we ask for when he gave his life? You got to love somebody to die for them. There's people all in this place here that you love your children, but... I don't know many people that want to just die for them. You say, well, yeah, I would for my kid. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I thought the other day, I love my kids too, but I'm being honest. I don't want to die for you. The, the other week, or uh, this past week, we heard about the little boy who the alligator got and pulled him out, and the father jumped in. cannot rid your child out of the jaws of an alligator. Now, common sense, I hate this happen. I hate this happen to my baby. And I'm going to cry about it. But coming to get you? No. Can't do it. Because common sense tells me I don't have the strength to fight an alligator. And if I try to get you out of his mouth, I'm going to rip you apart. There's no way you can't win. So people just look at me when I say things like that, like, gee, would you, you wouldn't die for our kids. No, I would not. See, I told my husband one time we were on the plane going to, going to Germany, and they was giving us all the instructions if the plane goes down and all this stuff. We over the ocean, so most of the flights over the ocean. So uh, they just talking up a storm about this is what you do, and I didn't pay them no attention. So my husband told me, he said, oh, yeah. And I said, uh, I'm not worried. He said, what do you mean you're not worried? I said, if this plane goes down, I'm jumping on your back, and that's going to be my seat. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Ain't no use to go in there. Because I'm, uh, he says, what about the kids, honey? I said, what about them? <laughs> what about them? I'm trying to live. So no use of me making these great big words of what I would do if that was my child. I would have jumped in the, in, in the water just like that man did. You're dumb. You're dumb. You can't save them. Now, if there was a situation that happened with your children and you could save them, good, save them. I would too. But I'm not getting ready to drown for you. Because I can't swim no way. I'd be stupid to jump in the water. See? But you got to make up in your mind, look, wait a minute. When it's all said and done, the only thing that matters is what's sure. It's what's sure. I look at these people, I'm thinking, why do y'all keep going back in the water every year? I don't love nothing that much that I could possibly be ate up by a shark or an alligator get me or whatever. I'm thinking, come on. Why do you keep going back? I, I went to Florida many times on vacation. I love the ocean at a distance. I never, I never get close enough to put my feet in the water, ever. Most of the time, I'm on the balcony of my room and out there looking at it. My girls are down there walking on the beach, and, and they're waving at me, and I'm waving at them because I sure ain't coming down. <laughs> so, Mom, just come on, go down there with us. There's something weird about the ocean, and it's this. I was standing back. I had a good ways back, in fact. Had a good ways back, and but when the waves came in, I got this feeling it's pulling me. It felt like I was going in the water. I go, I need to go back upstairs. So at this time, it's just I feel. I said, why? Why do you feel being pulled in? Because the sand comes in and shifts back out. I don't need.
need sinking sand. See, I need solid something. Too many people have built their life, hopes, and dreams on sand. Sand moves with you. If you step on it, it moves. If you move again, it moves. You can't depend on things that only have a foundation of sand. You got to say, I need something solid, something that will work. And I knew the most solid thing I had was on that balcony. I said, I'm going upstairs, y'all. I came down, I pacified you a bit, but I'm going upstairs. I'm not, I'm not getting ready to stay down here. I don't like, I don't like the ocean close up. At a distance, it's beautiful. I talked to God, and he believed me and everything in him, how big he is, that he, the ocean, the scripture says he holds the waters in the skirts of his garment. If that be the case, my God, how big is his garment? He's so powerful. I take the scripture when I'm at the ocean, and I constantly go back to the scriptures, and I watch the waves that they come leaping in, and then they go right back out. Then I go to scripture where he said there are all the waves of the sea, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're waves uh, abound. They cannot pass. They cannot pass here. So that's why they skip back because they're under command. You can't go out there now. You got to stay here. So they have a limit where they can go. You may not have never wondered, why do the ocean do that? Well, it's under command. Everything's under command. Obey God except you. Think about it. So if you want something solid in your life, first of all, you got to recognize that God is the only sure thing in this world. If you think anything else is sure, it's not happening. When you, I think sometimes when we get in cars, we're so sure that car is going to work. What do they say? We press the gas and the car moves forward. We press, we press the brakes and it stops. And, and, and we're just confident. We can turn the key on knowing all this is a brand new car and the brakes ain't going out and, and everything. And sit back and ride with them. And even the brand new car is not sure. You say, that's why they say, some people say, I got a limit. But because they had too many issues with a new car. The thing about God, no matter how new or how old it is, you always get the same thing. It don't change because of situation. It don't change because of things. It is what it is. It's always going to be there. Abraham, I swear to you, I'm going to bless you. I swear to you, because I can swear by no greater, I swear by myself. None of y'all, you swear by yourself don't mean nothing. So I swear by on my mama's grave. What good is that? She's like, if she swore on her mama's grave, that's saying a lot. That means nothing. You can swear on anything you want to swear on. I'm telling you, nothing is sure. See, he has promised us. He said this to every one of us. I'm not man that I should lie. I'm not man that I'm going to tell you I'm going to do something and don't do it. Don't worry about it. If I tell you, it's going to happen. If Jesus said it, then that's what it is. You hold on to that you with everything in your spirit. I got something to hold on to. Somebody bring you bad news, and it don't matter. God's in control. If you go to the doctor, he says that you'll be dead in three months. God's in control. As long as I know he's in control, life and death doesn't rest in the doctor's hand, but rather in God's hand. So no matter what the news may be, it is determined by what God wants to do. And so if we believe that, we have something to look forward to. <laughs> the good thing about God, he's not limited. He don't have limits. All of us, no matter how strong we are, no matter what we've done or whatever, we have limits. We can only go so far. So if I did want to go further with you, I am limited. But when you go to somebody who don't have any limits, he can do anything he wants because he's a miracle worker. He can open doors that nobody else opened. He can put us in places nobody else could. And you'll sit there, people ask you, how did this work for you? How did this happen for you? Because God put you there. He made it possible. So you got to look at your life and say, what sure things do I have in my life today? If you really had to count it all up, what sure that you have? And I'm mighty afraid most people have their confidence in something that is not sure. 
cannot, you cannot say, well, I know, I know my husband, I know my wife. You do. They're still limited. Mom and dad, they're still limited. God says, it becomes unbelievably powerful when he says, there's nothing greater than me. I'm it. See, he don't have to go and get an approval. He don't have to search things out, work it out, see if it'll work. None of that's with God. But because he is God, he is I am. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is everything you need no matter what. <laughs> don't turn him a loose, honey. You hear the commercial said New York is the life, uh, uh, life, life insurance that, that you should keep. It might work. We hope it works. My grandmother had an insurance policy many, many years ago. <laughs> they used to have these little policies that they buy at the insurance, I mean, at the, at the, at the, uh, at the funeral home. So my grandmother had bought hers. It wasn't very much. I, I can't remember what it was now, but uh, Mr. Gates, he ended up destroying all the money that my grandmother put in put into that arena business. He got to the end, none of that. However he did it, I don't remember because I was quite young, but <laughs> whatever he did, he beat her out of her money and no insurance. I tell you something. Black people as a whole, we are known, we don't trust banks a lot. That's a common thing that's known among the black race of people. You know why? Because we always feel sure when it's in our hand. I re, I, I'm reminded when I, when I think about this some years ago, they had um, the home is, the savings, the savings and loan uh, crisis. And people were at the bank, they were at the door wanting to get their money out. The door is locked. You can't get in. Had you got in, it still wouldn't have made any difference. Because you can't get go back there and get your money. You don't know if it's, if it's supposed to be yours, but when it gets in the bank's hands, the bank's money. It's like, well, yeah, you'll, you'll find it out real soon. So we have this feeling that I'm sure of it if I got it. I'm sure of it if I don't let you have it. When my husband passed away, <laughs> we had several insurance policies on him. And one, um, I went to the bank and I had my daughter go and deposit it in the bank. So after so many days, I wanted to get my money out. I just feel comfortable with getting in. And um, they said, Miss Banks, you can't. I start thinking, like, why are you so upset over my money? I didn't ask you for a loan. I ain't got to tell you what I'm going to do with it. Why is it that you got, you feel like uh, you're trying to figure out, why don't you leave it with us? And I'm feeling real upset at this point. If I don't want to leave it with you, I'm not going to. Give me my money. We don't want to get uptight, but you're going to make me uptight while you're standing here asking me all this, all these questions as if I applied for a loan. Just give me my money. Miss Banks, could you think of that? I thought y'all were crazy. You were insane. This one fellow came in, and they'll do it to a black and a man, but they also do it to a white. This man came, <laughs> the man came in. He wanted to draw a large sum of money out of his account. Like, and and when they told so and so, you don't you don't want to do that. Just give me my money. That man cursed them out. He said, "This is my so and so money, and what I'm gonna do with it is my business and not yours. Give me my money." I mean, he didn't worry about nothing. You just give it to me. I thought, what is that? What is it with y'all? That y'all can't release what belongs to somebody else. Without giving you a reason, you don't want to go out the bank. Somebody might might st uh, steal money from you. When they look at me, they don't think I got any money. It's not I, uh, not like, like I look like I'm a millionaire. So no, I don't believe that either. 
Understand, whatever you commit to God, he's going to work it for your good. I don't care what it is, if you give money or however your time in prayer, whatever it is, he's going to make it worth your while. He's not going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. He already knows you already. So you don't have to worry about it. You're not put through the third degree of all these things that, that you can do and can't do. And, and man will give you all these rules that he don't even live by himself. Hey, you don't do this, and you shouldn't do that. You should. So did you do it? Well, yeah, I did it. Well, what are you talking about? I can't understand. The only sure word is God. That's the only sure thing we got. All the rest of it, it really don't matter. See, he says, my soul wait only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Whatever I get, I expect it to come from God. I'm not looking for people. I'm not looking for situations, but rather whatever I'm going to get, I'm going to get it because God's going to give it to me. My expectations are here. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, and I shall not be moved. You are not shaken and worried about anything because God is your defense. He's standing in place. All you got to do is just trust him. It's going to be okay. He's going to protect you. No matter what. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs and discretion, with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever, for the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemy. So everything that, 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 that David's speaking about here is all sure stuff. You don't have to worry. You can lay down at night and go to sleep, and you don't have to worry about somebody coming in and killing you in the middle of the night. You can go to sleep and not be troubled with a bunch of things. You know why, you know why most of America cannot sleep? This right here. They can't stop thinking about this and about that. And suppose, and it might be, and it could be, and maybe it's tomorrow, or maybe it's not. That's why you can't sleep. If you get too many things on your mind, you don't get a good night's sleep. I have a lot of things on my mind a lot of times, and, and there's things that I think pretty much that I put at the feet of Jesus, I'm going to sleep, and I still don't go to sleep right away. <laughs> of course, that has something to do with other things in my life. But I, I look at that, and I think, God, I'm so thankful that, that I know tomorrow is going to be okay because you're in charge. You got, it, you got it in control. And so no matter what happens, Whatever tomorrow holds, I won't worry about it because he holds my tomorrow. He knows how to fix it. He knows when something bad is coming our way, and he's already prepared a way for you. <laughs> yes. You got to understand that. Yes, but if a man lived many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Said, hey, you're going to have a lot of bad days. But the thing is, who do you have to take you through that? Somebody says, I ain't going over there. They're they having a hard time. I got my own trouble. I saw them coming. I thought, don't come here. I'm trying to deal with my own issue. But God's never going to push us away. He's never going to say, don't come. He's always got his hands out to help us, to bring us in. And to say, come here, let me hold you. Let me put my arms around you. Let me show you that I can fix what your problems seem to be impossible. I can fix it. And he really can. Too many people don't have the experience of knowing that he'll fix it. They don't have that. They, they don't know him. He's a stranger to them. They've never had a relationship with him. See, he said, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. He said, I made everything sure. Everything's solid. It's not going to shift. <laughs> the first house that we bought in Colorado Springs, the man who sold us the house, he's very cheap, cheapskate. He never hardly called in a contract. He always tried to do everything himself. So, 
had it evaluated and all that. But we did not know that we were the person who took that story. We know that the room on the lower level on the back of the house was busy packing boxes. We didn't even know that. You don't have a foundation. I mean, the wind just sweep you all around. It's one of our rooms. didn't go over somebody's roof and go ahead somewhere. We didn't know it. How I found out? Because I got ready to add on to that room. And when the man came out to take a look at it, and when they got ready to start the, start the construction, he said, this house has no foundation. This room, rather, has no foundation. So it's just, it's just sitting here. So it was good that I added on because I found out that something could have moved that room all the way off, off out of place. So they began to build and they made another foundation and brought it into this where it should have been. And but I didn't know it was it was it wasn't there. How many of you this morning don't even not even sure if you have a foundation at all? What are you sitting on right now? What are you depending on? Uh, do you have a solid foundation? Something that for sure is going to last. Do you have that? Check your life and say, what do I have that's really sure? The only sure thing is God. And if you've excused him out of your life and you've not let him in, you don't have a sure thing. Anything could shake you and put you into, a, make you a nervous wreck and put you into a, a, a tizzy of some sort. Understand. Get something under that. Now, it may, you may look good right now, but when the storm comes, when the wind blows, are you solid? Is the foundation solid enough that you don't lose it? I lost my job. We just bought a new house. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Everything is messed up. I mean, how can I pay my house payment? You're in a mess. You're in a mess. If you had him, you would say, everything's going to be all right. Somehow, God is going to get me through this situation. I don't even have to understand it. I don't have to figure out the plan, but I know he's got one. And if you trust him, he'll get you through it. I thought many times in my life, having seven children, being in the military, sure ain't got enough money. And I always had to trust God for that. And it wasn't enough. But I had him that I could lean on. I had him that I could trust. That somehow when it's not enough, you can bless what I got and it'll go further. You said that don't happen. That's because you don't know who he is. If you knew who he was, you would say, I got you, Sister Rose. I got you. It's true. So you don't have to be troubled. By because little is much when God sends it. Take the money that you've made this week and say, for instance, maybe I'm running a little short. Just hold it up to God. Say, Lord, bless this money. I need you to bless this for me so that it'll take care of what I need to take care of. I go back to the scripture. The word of God says, uh, he said, if you do what's right, then I'll bless you. You'll be blessed with a blessing. If you don't, you'll be cursed with a curse. I had to go to the commissary to buy for seven kids. You know, that's no small thing. And if you have one, you thought you'd have to probably have seven. So the scripture says, I'll bless your basket in the store. It says that. It says that. Uh-huh. I'll bless your basket in the store. So I went in there, pulled out four baskets, and I ain't got four baths of money. You say, well, that was stupid. Wait, you're going to feel stupid when I'm done. And so I says to the Lord, you said you'll bless my basket in the store. I'm going to ask you to ride on each one of them. He says, I I got seven babies here. Who who give them to me to eat? Honey, what do you think? I didn't put nothing back. I I think it's hard when you walk through stores. uh, People got to calculate it down the aisle. Talking about, no, put that back, baby. No, we don't put that back. Oh, my auntie did that to me one time. I never forgot. <coughs> and I'll tell you what she did to us after I tell this story. And I go 
put the push the four baskets on up front. And they start ringing up. I just sit there and say, I know I'm going to have enough, but God said you bless my basket in the store if I live right. So when she rung it up, the total, I don't remember what it is, too many years, my kids are all old and grown. And so she made me come, she said, she started looking at the table. She said, I'm, I'm sure I didn't miss anything. I was so chicken inside, I thought, he's on my basket, but you don't know about Got all my food, had enough money to pay for it, and left. He will take care of you. I'll provide for you. That's why he's called Jehovah Jireh. Whatever you need, I got it. Now, Aunt Charlene, who's dead now, me and Hannah used to go down to Sparta, Illinois, to spend our, our great summer in the country. I didn't want to go down there, but, I, you know, it's a little small, small town. One grocery store. So, and Charlene goes to the store and gets these baskets and puts all these food in the basket. And me and Hannah's there with her. And she gets to the counter. And the woman brings it up, and she ain't got but two or three baskets. I remember that as well as yesterday. And she had me and my sister running back down the aisle, putting things on the shelf. I got so mad, I thought, oh, she had too many dollars. Why'd you put all that stuff in there? I, apparently, he didn't ride her basket. And I told him, I said, I'm so ashamed. Take this back down and put it on the shelf. Just take your stuff out the basket. Because she got down to 20 bucks. I never forgot the frustration, the humiliation, everything that goes with that. And I'm glad the store wasn't full of people. We went at a time where many people that we run down the aisle like two little idiots putting food back on the shelf until we until she finally said this is twenty dollars. But I never forgot it. Never forgot it. Wanted to say something to her so bad, but in those days you dare not say nothing. Just take it, but I, I thought a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> this is un, this is uncalled for. So if if he's not in your life, and if he doesn't control your life, don't do what I did. It won't work for you. You said, "What was that? She picked up, she dumped four baskets." You ain't me. Are you serving God? Are you living for Him every day? Are you getting away from the sin? Are you doing what the word says, what is right and what's wrong? Where are you in there? Because that's what makes this work. That's what makes this work. You've got to be able to have a, a, a communication with him for it to work. Some people don't pray unless they have trouble. They have trouble, that's when they pray. That's not, you're not going to use God or take advantage of him. It's not for me. Ask yourself, where am I at? Where is, what is my relationship with God? You say, well, I really don't know that. Well, you would have to know because, I mean, due to the fact that you know what your relationship with, is with everything else. You know, you know whether your boyfriend planned to leave you or not, all the signs on the uh, cards on the table, except you too stupid to take a look at it. But if you take a look at it, you realize, oh, he's planning out. He's getting out. I always say, if you're in a relationship, don't get left. It just feels better. That feels better. I can say I, I left him, honey. Because when he said he left me, it kind of leaves me with like, uh, well, what was wrong with me? No, I left you. So now the question is, what's wrong with you, buddy? It's unbelievable. But if we stay with God, he ain't never going to leave you. You don't have to plan something in case he does. You don't have to have a plan A and a plan B because what God told you, you just need to walk in that. But you got to live right. You got to be a Christian. In this hour, everybody's a Christian if you let people tell it. Everybody's a Christian. The liars, the whole mongers, the cheaters, the dope, the dope dealers, everybody's a Christian. 
not so. He said, you'll know them by the fruit that they bear, whether or not they're Christian or not. You say, you don't judge people, I don't, the word does. It'll tell you whether you're a Christian, read it. Look into it. It'll tell you exactly where you are, whether you're doing it right or you're doing it wrong. It's not hard to find out. So, look at this. Whatever comes up, Things that we don't understand. Just have something sure to lean on. You need the rock. Something solid. But I can lean on this and it ain't going to move. It ain't going to shift. Because it's solid. Where are you this morning? Do you, can you really say, I'm in a solid place? I'm in a good place? Because tomorrow, before the day ends, your day can suddenly take a complete turn. You know that. That's why death hits the soul so hard because suddenly, without warning oftentimes, it hits us and leaves us like, oh my God, what happened? What happened? How am I going to go on? What am I going to do? You know, I'm going to do I'm going to make it through this. You have to have God to make it through. My 29-year-old daughter died Four years after her dad passed away. I preached both of them's funeral. Me and my daughter, she was the twin. I had a set of twins, a boy and a girl. She was the girl twin, and we talked about it. I knew she was going, I knew the Lord was coming to take her. I knew it before it happened. We talked about it. it hers wasn't a shock. I never grieved my daughter. I knew why God took her. He told me all about it. I had a full story about it. Therefore, it, I, it comforted me to know that God had done something good uh, by removing my daughter at this time. So it was okay. But sometimes people have bad things happen to them just one after another. This thing happened, that thing happened, this one happened, that happened. And it's just, it just sends your life, sends you in this tailspin. Before I can get over one, I'm already involved with another. Before I can finish this, already something else here. That's the way it have it happened with Job. While the other one, while somebody was still telling him bad news, another one came and said, I have news. And none of it was good. Your children are dead. All your cattle is gone. All the things that you have that made you wealthy, everything is gone. It's just one bad thing after another. But you know what kept Job strong? It was what he was leaning on. It's what he built on. He built on God. So he said, the Lord take it. The Lord give it. I mean, the Lord give it. The Lord take it away. What did he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. You just can't say that without God. You're not ready to bless the Lord. And the scripture says, and Job worshiped him. I ain't been to church in years since, uh, since my mom and dad died. I thought, well, why did God take my mother? We already know he's going to take your mother, your daddy, your grandma, and everybody. We live with that every day. That's a fact of life. Every person in this room, no matter how much you love them, they're going to die. And then they get mad with God. He told you ahead of time they're going to die. Once it's appointed to man to die after that to the judgment. So we already know that. Then why are we upset with God? He told you ahead of time. But for some reason, he shouldn't have took your mother. That's strange. He took my mother. He took my father. He took my brother. He took my husband. He took my daughter. He said, I just feel like, you know, that God did me wrong. I've been mad at God. Well, the craziest thing you could ever do is get mad with God. That's the one you need to help you. <laughs> Don't get mad with God. That's your help. That's your help, honey. If you get mad with your help, you don't have nothing. See, you got to understand. I must look up and know for sure that whatever God has allowed in my life, be it painful, disappointment, there's something wrapped up in that that's good. All things work together for good to them that love God. 
and are called according to his purpose. Everything that happens to the people that are serving God, it all works out for your good. Now, if you ain't serving God and you are not a Christian, you're not living for him, it don't work out for your good. He said those that love God, it works out for, it, for their good. Amen. Now, how is this supposed to be good? How is this supposed to be good? Because I feel it. I feel it. When I lost my husband, that did not feel good. I knew he was going to take it. I didn't know it. It was so sad. 54, I was 49. You know, people living for the day when they're all these kids, they're grown, they're married, out of the house. You don't hear nobody hollering, Mama, make him quit. Mama, he's hitting me. Stop it. Would you go? Um, we was living for that day. When all of our kids got out of the house, I remember me and Charles sitting there and said, Charles said, Look at this. And I said, Listen, man, he said, Oh, Listen to the quiet. No kids running, no kids screaming, uh, no kids back over here doing this one, hitting this one, hitting that. I'm going to tell mama, you you better quit dying. I'm going to try. Oh! We sat down in a chair. After we married off, we didn't have children. We didn't really have much, honey. And that felt so done our part, we raised them, gave them a good life, tried to get them through college. I don't want to go to college. All of them, most of them started college and never did finish it. My daughter sitting up in front of me and said, I hate school. Trying to get you in there so you don't have to come back and ask me to buy you something. That was going to feel good. Get, get an education so you get a decent job, take care of yourself, and you ain't always got to ask mama, will you lend me something? Will you help me? I don't want to help you. I want you to help yourself. I already done the help. I done my help. But she don't, she don't like school. I went to Blair Business College for, for four years and didn't get no degree. Most people get their degree in in, eight, in 15 months or 18 months. Four years, because half the time she never showed up. I said, oh, I hate school. My other daughter wanted to be an accountant. We got her in college, and she went for a while. Said, I want to be after school. I said, okay. So I tried to get somebody at least out of the seven. At least one. Nobody wants to go to college. But you know what I think happens? I think sometimes we make it so comfortable for our kids until they feel like they don't really have to go to college. Look at how it happened with mom. I think so. Because I was always trying to be sure that their things were okay for you and I'm here to help you to get good with and doing this for you. Bought them a brand new Mustang and, and so, so they have a car to go to college. My two sons and, and uh, they tore that car up. You know what? It didn't cost them nothing. I'm here to tell you the less you give your kids and make them work for it, the better off you are. That's a fact. When it comes too easy, what I'm going to college for, mama didn't go to college. I didn't have the opportunity you have. I didn't have it. There were no student loans and grants in my day. And nobody around us was going to college. We didn't have anything you could look at and say, boy, I'd like to be like that one back there. I could have done well. I could have excelled had I gone. Just the opportunity, uh, what was available wasn't available. Not for what's available to the children now. They don't want to go. I thought, okay. My oldest daughter got a job working out at Ford, Ford uh, what's that, Ford Credit? Ford microelectronics. Her check wasn't that bad. And all she did when she got her check was go buy something new. A new dress, some new shoes, something. That's all it could do is buy a dress or some shoes. So I, I'm, I don't want to go to college. Well, 
I wouldn't either if I if my check was little as yours. But you can make the, you can make a difference. You can change that. You can. I gave up. The dream you got for your kids, rest assured that it is not theirs. It is not there. It's not. It's not your dream. Is not their dream. Because we didn't have anything given to us. You had to do a little something to make a few dollars. But nobody gave you anything. My grandmother gave me 30 cents for lunch when I was in high school to get a full, to get everything uh, that, that you needed on the entree. It was 32 cents. Every day. I'm in school going down the line. You got two cents. You got two cents. You got two cents. The, the, the students were talking about me on the constant. Here come two cents. And I said to my grandmother, could you give me just two more pennies? No, gal, you better thank God for that 30 cents. Two pennies. For God's sake. I'm tired of begging. Going down the line, they start, when they see me coming, they say, two pennies. That's all I needed to get the entree. That's your meat, your vegetables, and whatever else, and something to drink. You ain't, I get, we ain't got no money, gal. You just take that 30 cents and go on and get what you can with it. I, 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 I couldn't get what I can. <laughs> <laughs> See, God will never leave you in an embarrassing situation. He's going to give you more than the two cents. He's going to abundantly bless you. You don't have to beg for two cents. But Lord, I just saw somebody's really tickled back there. Uh, understand, God is, he's one of these people that give a lot. I give you more. I give you more so you can give somebody else some. Not just for you. Not just for you. All his commandments are sure. You are sure you're safe from danger or harm. You don't have to worry about it. Firmly established. Marked by or given to feelings of confidence. Certainty. I'm certain this is going to work. There's nothing like certain that he's going to work it out. And you keep going forward and you know he's going to get you through it. And if you get to a place that somehow seems like I can't get through it, he'll help you to get through it. That's why some of y'all look so old. All your life. You don't see no smile. Or nothing. What is it? As you age, all them things are going to show up. Get permanent folds in your face. Permanent lines. It's tragic. I've never been a worry. That's something I did. My, my husband did a good job with that. He used to say, no, you don't. You, you, you just don't care about nobody, do you? I see you worrying. What did it give you? 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 Looking like this most of the time. I'm not. Yeah. You just have a no care attitude about everything. No, I don't. I realize the things that I can fix and the things I can't and used to worry about it. Move on with your life, honey. Give it to God to take care of that which you can't do nothing about and what you can take care of, take care of it. He will bless you with enough to do what you need to do. I don't care what anybody. You won't say, Rose, you go ahead on now. I gave you 50 cents now. Try to make that do. David said, thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Your testimonies, your word is very sure. Sure that I can count on it no matter what. See, the wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be assured. I'm guaranteed if I do what's right. I'm guaranteed to have what I need. Do you have any guarantees this morning? Don't go down and, and, and purchase something and say, 
And anything that you might spend a sizable amount of money on, you need a guarantee. You buy a new car, and they tell you, well, nothing's covered. You, you bought it, that's it. Most of us would not, I would hope to say, that most of us wouldn't, would not buy that car without warranty. Because these people turn out stuff too fast every day. That's why they have so many recalls. Because you turn them out too fast to hurry up and get rid. Keep the car on the line until you're finished with it. You knew it was going to be a problem when people got it and just, and just shipped it on out anyway. Then here you got thousands and thousands of cars being, being recalled because the ignition switch hangs up. You knew that ahead of time. See, nothing sure. Make sure you make God the sure thing in your life. The foundation of God standeth sure. That which he's, he's laid, it works. It will never crumble. It will never fall apart. It will always be there. Think about it. I bet you if I had, had to take a, a survey here this morning and say, do you agree you ain't worried about nothing? Some of them would lie. Some would say, I'm not worried about nothing, and pulling their hair out string by string. And depressed. That's, I mean, depression comes from people facing crisis that they don't know what to do with. There's no reason to get depressed if everything's going right. But you can't get out of it. You, you know, it's like worse and worse. Every time I look at it, it's, things just keep getting worse. When it rains, it pours. If it can go wrong, it will for me. Whole attitude is screwed up. See, no matter what happens, if you know that God's in control of it, you don't have to worry about it. He's going to get you through it. He loves you. He cares about you. God was bound by an oath that He gave Abraham by the fact that He He took that oath and said, "I swear by my own oath," and I tell you, it works. It works. See, if you want your life to change as of today. Say, I need to go up for prayer. Sister Rose will pray for you. Another minister will be on the other side who will pray for you. And say, I just ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. Wash me and make me clean. Fill me with him. And give me the power to say no to sin and yes to God. Because that's all you got to say to him. And mean it. And mean that. And from this day forward, your life will take on a change. Mine's did 50-something years ago. Yours can start for you. You say, well, I lost quite a few years by now. Uh, uh, make the last ones count. Do something good. Make a decision. I'm, we gonna, me and my house, Joshua said, me and my house, we're going to serve God. He spoke for his wife. He spoke for his children. He spoke for everybody. Men, men today, they can't even speak into their house. You know what the wife says? I don't pay a little attention. You say I praise y'all anyway. <laughs> I don't listen. My husband walked and said, All of us, we're going to serve God. Baby, if you want him, you better go ahead because don't count me in. You may, you may make that statement and feel good at the moment, but it's coming back to haunt you. If you make God the first thing in your life, number one, that's who I'm going to serve. That's who I'm going to put everything into. You'll be glad that you did. Our musicians and singers are coming forward. If you want prayer this morning, all you got to do is come up and let me pray for you. Is that going to make any difference? If your heart is open to God, it will. If you don't want to anyway, keep on going down your rough road. You'll look like a dried up piece of chitlin before it's all said and done. You should have some concern about how your corpse going to look when you're gone. I told my kids, I said, I, I'm hoping to make a good corpse. And if it ain't good, don't open it up. Yes. You have a great time. Well, a member of our church died some years, many years ago. I have never seen a corpse that bad in my she wasn't right inside. I said, you think that'll mess with your corpse? I think so. Man, my corpse is going to be beautiful. You're going to say, honey, did you, 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 that woman look like she's just sleeping. I am. 
I ain't dead. I'm sleeping. And he's going to wake me up in the first resurrection. See, I got something going on for me. I don't know about you. If you want to be able to keep moving, I mean, I'm moving a little slower than I used to move, but I'm moving. <laughs> Still work out. Three or four times a week. Do I like it? No. Do I think it's good for me? Yes. Because I don't think I'd be moving. They asked Dick Van Dyke, they said, how do you keep moving at 80-something? He said, I keep moving. Come on, people, get up. You know, we got a generation that is sedentary. They sit at a computer and wonder why as they begin to age, their rear end starts fanning out like that. Sitting down the entire time. In our day, there was no computers. We had, to, we had to work hard. There was no computer. I don't, I'm not fond of them to this day. I may get on there a few times and look for something, and if I can't find it, get my kids, because all of them know how to do computers, all of them. Get somebody, come here and pull this up for Mama. Mama, this is what she, why don't you just let us teach us? I, I don't want to learn anything at this age. Just show me what you fix that. I'm not interested. Your brain done slowed down. Hey. Thank God you still can do what you can do. I'm not into this high-tech age. Don't need it. I still get out my pills and paper. I cannot ask a person in my family what's 10 and 10 or 15 and 20 or 30 and 35. Hey, hold on a minute. I said, are you kidding me? You can't add in your head? We learn to add in our head. There was no computer. Got to pull it out for simple stuff. I don't know. You want God in your life? In this age, you better get it. The world's getting worse. It ain't getting better. So many things going wrong everywhere. We, we got an election here. It's the worst we ever seen in the history of this country. The craziest fool on the planet is running for president. That's sad. When, I mean, even their own party still going still gonna to try to vote on me. I thought, honey, you ain't seen crazy yet. Donald Trump, we ain't seen the end of it yet. Stone crazy. I turned him on for a joke so I could laugh every day. Let me see what he's saying today because that man's stone crazy. He said, I don't want to get caught up and worried about it. This one get in the office or that one get in the office. What's going to happen here? What's going to happen there? Don't worry about that. It's in God's hand. He's going to take care of you no matter how it does. Yes. 